Hi guys. It is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, over the top beautiful day. Here in the collapse of everything. It is Wednesday, August 23rd, but we're going to pretend that it is Thursday, August 24th. <coughs> As I press ahead with something I have never done in Collapse Chronicles or anywhere else. 15 years on YouTube. Uh, so this will be part two of a five-part series where I am uh, reading word for word, verbatim, the single greatest spot on analysis of the state of humanity, global industrial society, and this planet that I have ever encountered in 15 years down here uh, digging around uh, in, in the doomosphere. And this is from uh, my my hero and now my number one hero on the planet <coughs> that would be professor dr william reese who i have had the pleasure of interviewing here and you can i'll put the link to that interview so shockingly i found this uh, in the mainstream media on a Wednesday morning, and none other than Popular Mechanics. Uh, a, a, a absolute shocker that Popular Mechanics did a condensed version of this, and then Popular Mechanics uh, linked us over to the this uh, long uh, analysis from some outfit simply called World, World, where uh, William Reese has penned his magnum opus titled The Human Ecology of Overshoot, Why a Major Population Correction is Inevitable. Uh, and, of course, I will put the link on here. You need to shut me up. You need to read, clear your slate, and you need to read every, one, every word of this. Anybody wanting to understand why we're doomed. It's right here, guys. It's right here. I, I might as well fold up this channel uh, when I get to the end of this slog. So, uh, in part one, we read the abstract the introduction and the chapter titled The Nature and Nurture of Overshoot. You can find all that elsewhere in part one. And so today, this rant shouldn't be quite as long. We're, we're just going to take it a chapter at a time. And this is uh, obviously the uh, chapter nearest and dearest to my heart, uh, titled The Population Connection, The Population Connection to Human Overshoot. I <laughs> think there's a connection, Bill. So, uh, William Reese starts out with a quote by philosopher John Gray <coughs> to uh, open up this section. Quote, the human mind serves evolutionary success, not truth. To think otherwise is to resurrect the pre-Darwinian error that humans are different from all other animals. Thank you, John Gray. And with that, William... Reese is going to explain to us the population connection to uh, overshoot. <clears throat> Which brings us back to the population conundrum. 
in the simplest term terms overshoot results from too many people consuming and polluting too much you know my favorite billionaire uh Ted Turner, you know, 30 years ago, talking about the, what is wrong with this planet is too many people eating too much stuff. And so we're going to let uh, William Reese expand on uh, my favorite billionaire with five children. Okay. In the simplest terms, overshoot results from too many people consuming and polluting too much. The immediate physical cause is excess economic throughput, i.e. resource consumption and waste production. But th throughput is itself driven by both rising incomes and population growth. Most people tend to spend and consume to the limits imposed by their discretionary incomes and since the introduction of easy credit, often well beyond. High-income countries and populations are therefore responsible for three-quarters of excess material consumption and pollution to date. Even in 2021, <clears throat> the top 10% of emitters were responsible for almost half of global energy-related CO2 emissions, compared with a mere 0.2% for the bottom 10%. For the past several decades, however, incremental increases in humanity's consumption-based ecological footprint and carbon emissions have been driven more by population growth than increased incomes and consumption in all income quartiles. <coughs> Indeed, population growth accounted for approximately 80% of the increase in the total human ecological footprint above what would have occurred had populations remain constant even as incomes increased. Okay, uh, William Reese is pulling off the gloves in this uh, pointless uh, overpopulation, overconsumption debate, spelling it out. Did anybody fail to hear this? Incremental increases in humanity's consumption-based ecological footprint and carbon emissions have been driven more by population growth than increased incomes and consumption in all income brackets. So uh, all you people who act like you know more about this than William Reese, would you please come out here in the comments and bray your ignorance. Okay. I will add someone who is never born has an ecological footprint of exactly zero. There is one way to bring your ecological footprint to zero, and that is a to die, and better yet, never to be born. Anyway, I'm going to get back to William. Try not to interrupt 
uh, this genius. In this light, it is worth noting that in 2023, about 4 billion people, half the human family, reside in lower to middle income and low income countries. Those countries with the highest population growth rates and whose people have yet to satisfy their material needs. The combination of population growth, massive latent demand, and rising GDP per capita, the latter fully justified, represents a huge potential increase in future global consumption and pollution, poses a double challenge to ecospheric integrity on a planet already in overshoot and rather belatedly underscores the need for greater equity in access to resources for the world's people. It should also be obvious from these data and trends that any global approach to harmonizing the human enterprise with the ecosphere must include population planning. Nevertheless, until recently, the population question was out of bounds, even in academia, largely on religious, cultural, and humanist grounds, or other spurious charges that analysts were implicitly racist. You know, anybody claiming that uh, this world is overpopulated, especially if you are a honky saying that Nigeria is overpopulated, you are a racist. I, I was actually surprised that I only had to ban one person after my recent Nigeria rant from a couple of days ago. All right. As the ballooning cost of extreme weather, biodiversity loss, land and soil degradation, wildfires, regional famines, energy shortages, pollution, etc., affect more and more people, the obvious benefits of smaller human numbers are finally dissolving the population taboo. And I know you guys are wondering, and I honestly do not know how many children and grandchildren uh, William Reese has. I am 99% sure that William Reese is a breeder. <clears throat> anyway, just some background information. Back to uh, the proud daddy and grandpa William Reese. While it is becoming increasingly important that policy analysts and politicians fully understand what population is all about, they will not receive a complete picture from most mainstream demographers. Gee, do you think so? Oddly, despite their focus on population dynamics, demographers make little reference to key elements of population biology or environmental influences. Most human population projections are based on purely demographic factors, base population, age and sex distribution, age-specific fertility, fertility <coughs> and mortality rates, and migration where applicable, i.e. they are conducted in a contextual vacuum. In addition, faulty input inputs may skew the outcome. Population analyst James O'Sullivan argues 
that the flawed assumptions of the UN's population model and even that of the Earth for All Consortium place their projections, quote, firmly in the realm of fairy tale, close quote. The UN expects the human population to peak at around 10.4 billion people towards the end of the century. Earth for All's too little, too late peak projection is for 8.7 billion in the early 2050s. Its giant leap estimate tops out at about 8.4 billion in the early 2040s. Even with reasonable demographic assumptions, model results will be valid only if all exogenous factors crucial to population health and security can be maintained through the projection period. The assumption is simplistically unrealistic. The population is in a state of advanced overshoot, dangerously eroding human carrying capacity. Climate scientists, ecologists, environmentalists, and even some demographers are now sounding the alarm over mounting population pressures, even arguing we would all be better off if there were fewer of us. Uh, so what are some of the evolutionary roots of population as problem? Every concerned citizen should understand the basics of human population dynamics. First, as noted at the outset, human populations, like those of other species, are capable of exponential, also known as geometric growth, under favorable environmental conditions. A population growing exponentially at a fixed rate will have a constant doubling time. For example, the human population reached its peak growth rate of 2.2% per year in the early 1960s when the global population was about 3.2 billion. Had this rate been sustained, the population would have continued doubling every 32 years. As matters stand, the average fertility rate has declined, so the population has increased only, only two and a half times in 60 years. This is, you know, this thing that the, these clueless morons, I was just reading an article in the Telegraph, uh, you, you know, where this writer could not understand how fertility rates continue to keep falling and the population continues to keep growing. It is not rocket science, it's population dynamics that nobody can understand because they don't want to know the truth. Okay. Exponential growth is a form of positive feedback where each increment to the population adds to the reproductive base just as annual interest adds to the capital in a bank account. However, under natural conditions, most species, including humans, rarely realize their full reproductive potential. Positive feedback growth is countered or in humans' case, used to be countered by various forms of negative feedback. 
disease, food shortages, hostile competitors, etc., so that natural populations typically fluctuate around a long-term mean. New numbers rise when conditions are favorable and fall when conditions change for the worse, often because of the bloated population itself. Disease is easily spread and starvation may be caused by excessive population densities. Evolutionary biologists recognize that different species have evolved different reproductive strategies. Humans are archetypal K-strategists. K-strategic species are typically large, <coughs> long-lived organisms <coughs> with relatively low <coughs> reproductive rates, long gestation periods, intensive parental care, and low infant mortality rates. At the other end of the spectrum are R strategists, typically smaller, short-lived organisms with short life cycles, very high fecundity, little parental investment, and high progeny mortality rates. Species continually depends on the survival of a tiny percentage of a very large number of offspring. K strategists are most frequently adapted to relatively stable habitats where, because of their high survival rates, they tend to press up against the local carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is the average maximum sustainable population for a particular habitat. Thus, K represents the fluctuating equilibrium established between the species' geometric, geometric growth potential and various negative feedbacks, e.g. food, water shortages, and spatial limitations that kick in when conditions deteriorate or excess numbers stress the habitat. These dynamics were the basis for Malthus's concern that population growth potential would always outstrip food supply. <clears throat> Why is this significant again today? As noted at the outset, anatomically, modern humans have been around about 250,000 years. For most of this period, the population growth curve was essentially flat. There was a barely detectable global increase in Homo sapiens spread from Africa over the rest of the planet over the past 50 millennia and a modest uptick with the adoption of agriculture 10 millennia ago that for the most part widely dispersed Human populations have historically fluctuated close to their local carrying capacities. Suppressed by negative feedback, it took 99.9% of human history for the world population to reach 1 billion in the early 1800s. With the scientific and industrial revolutions, everything changed. In particular, improving public health greatly lowered mortality rates and the increased use of fossil-fueled technologies both steadily increased the availability of food 
and provided the means of access to all the other resources needed to grow the human enterprise. In just 200 years, one 125th the time it took to reach the first billion, the human population ballooned to 7 billion by 2011 and reached 8 billion only 11 years later in November 2022. Meanwhile, human material demands on the ecosphere increased by more than two orders of magnitude, with a greater than 100-fold increase in real gross world product. Ironically, only eight out of 10,000 generations of humans have lived this briefest of notable periods in human evolutionary history. Yet, today's modern techno-industrial society takes this utterly anomalous growth spurt to be the norm and is doing everything conceivable to maintain it. And then, of course, he has to uh, show you the uh, hockey stick graph. But we're going to break there and come back in uh, our next video with William Reese talking about on energy gradients Homo sapiens as a dissipative structure. Speaking of energy gradients, I have got to go use some fossil fuel energy to drive my gas sucking truck to the laundromat to uh, wash about uh, 500 wash and, of course, dry in the electric dryers uh, and then drive back from the laundromat about 500 bed sheets as uh, the peak of vacation season cranks up in earnest. Get out there and enjoy being part of the uh, population hockey stick while well, you still can uh, because this hockey stick is getting ready to uh, have its mirror coming up some point soon. My gosh.